Hello, everyone. My name is Eddie Smith uh, from Midwestern Marks, here with Carlos Garrido, as always, um, but also a very special guest. We're very pumped to have Chandler on today, the communard on TikTok. Um, how are you doing good. today, Chandler? I'm doing good. I'm excited to be on here. Uh, I've been looking forward to this, and yeah, uh, it's going to be a great conversation. For sure. You've been probably my favorite person on TikTok um, for since I joined the app, um, always spreading the, the love through the comments. And I can tell, uh, though we've had limited face-to-face -face interaction, we think uh, very similarly about socialism. Um, so I'm very happy to have you on to have a little bit of a more long-form discussion here. Yeah, no, absolutely. I feel the same about you. You were one of the first accounts that I came across um, on TikTok that had to do with uh, socialism. I, before, I had just like seen like random videos pop up on my um, on my feed, and then I saw some of your videos, and I started getting more into it. And I decided to like start making my own. And here we are. So yeah, <laughs> for sure, for sure. So we wanted to talk a little bit um, about Huey P. Newton and and also his book Revolutionary Suicide. Um, Huey P. I mean, I, I'll let you guys mostly talk about him because you know more than me. But you said he was one of the one of the figures who inspired you to get into maybe not leftism but Marxism specifically. So if you just want to talk about that, um, yeah, I think that'd be great. Yeah. Um, so at the time, uh, I hadn't read much. Um, I hadn't read much theory or really read much at all. Uh, I had considered myself to be a communist. Um, but I fell more along the lines of uh, anarchism. And one of my friends recommended that I read Revolutionary Suicide. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's uh, Huey P. Newton's autobiography, who uh, along with Bobby Seale founded the Black Panther Party. And it's just about his life. Um, and it, it's, it's really interesting because he goes into not just his life story, but he ties it all in with theory and how his life story led him to uh, you know, approaching the world with the framework of analysis that he used. So reading it was really interesting because it introduced me to a lot of uh, concepts within Marxism that I hadn't really paid much attention to before. I'd really just looked into anarchism. And that's what really opened me up to looking into uh, Marxist forms of communism and, you know, reading Lenin and now here I am. Um, but Huey P. Newton is still to this day my favorite Marxist theorist of all time. Um, was just a brilliant mind and had a crazy life. For sure. Um, Carl, as you said, you read some of the philosophy of Huey P. Newton too. Um, maybe not the whole book. Uh, do you have anything you want to ask Chandler? Um, well, I just wanted to comment that I, I do agree. He's, he's probably one of the, in terms of praxis, revolutionary praxis, one of the most active ones that we've had in our history. Um, and you, you look at the stuff that he's engaging with. He says specifically in um, the chapter where he's talking about the founding of the Black Panthers. Um, who is he engaging with? Well, he's engaging with Fanon, the wretched of the earth. He's engaging with Che Guevara's works. He's engaging with Mao. Um, and, and the funny thing is that we have an organization that's founded on, on these principles of, of Marxist socialism. Um, on anti-colonial struggle, and and we have today certain figures from from this organization or just the aesthetic um, that just gets whitewashed. So I think like like many of the other figures in, in the black radical tradition that that um, parts of their message are kept, other parts are are removed. Um, it's important work that we have to do uh, with with Huey P. Newton and and then the Panthers to reaffirm what what they actually stood for, which was revolutionary socialism. They looked at the black community as not just oppressed in the U.S., but they looked at them as living in a colonial situation. They looked at black communities um, like they looked at Palestine, right? Um, and and the, the framework that we have to use when we engage with these revolutionary thinkers is an honest one. We can't just dilute uh, the messages. And part of our task is to reaffirm beliefs that they had. And as socialists in the U.S., um, we have to come to, to, to face the fact that at least in the 20th century, um, the history of the socialist and communist movement is, it, you can't separate it from the history of black liberation. Um, uh, no, uh, you can't. Vanguard, no, you can't. The vanguard has been uh, primarily black and the communities that have been the most receptive to it have been primarily black. 
So it's really yeah. a, 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 a special struggle. And, and I mean, these are these are leaders that I that I definitely look up to. That plays a, that plays a lot into. Uh, I liked how you mentioned how he used uh, Fanon for developing his uh, framework of analysis because Fanon is one of my favorite Marxist thinkers of all time as well. Even though many people don't classify him as that, he used dialectical material throughout his approach, nonstop, constantly. And I actually um, was in a, a, a class on. I'm a history political science student right now, and I had a, a history course on the history of the Black Panther Party and the Black Power Movement at the end of the semester. We got to write an essay uh, on anything we wanted as long as it had to do with the Black Panther Party. And I, I did this um, essay basically analyzing Huey's uh, framework of analysis through the lens of the wretched of the earth. Um, just pointing out like how I, I believe no one influenced Huey more than Fanon because you look at what Huey says and um, Fanon's uh, analysis of you know, classes within the colonial context and how the lumpen proletariat is the truly revolutionary class. Huey translated the, that over to the United States and um, talked about how that's why the Vanguard Party needs to be a party for Black liberation as well, because just because of the specific material conditions in the United States. And that's why you've always seen the Black Panther Party was the closest we've gotten to achieving socialism in the U.S. You look at Communist Party USA, most of, our, most of their history, they've been a joke. Huey talks about that um, in To Die for the People um, because they actually, they treated the Black Panther Party horribly. They, you know, treated them as fake Marxists, as fake communists. And Huey tore them apart because he's like, when have y'all, where's there ever been a period in history where the government has come for y'all, where they've killed you in your homes, where they've arrested you, where they've tried shutting you down from the inside, from the outside. Never. There's been a couple of instances of people getting arrested, but with the Black Panther Party, they're getting, I mean, you look at Fred Hampton killed in his home while sleeping next to his pregnant girlfriend. You look at Huey P. Newton in and out of prison for things that he didn't even do. You look at, I mean, all of them, all of them went through this and it really goes to show that that's the closest we've gotten and that's why it's so important to study their history because this is the closest that we've gotten to achieving um, a you know truly successful socialist movement in the United States. Well, one yeah, of the things I, that I would. Sorry, it's, ahead, it's in relation to this comment. So one of the things that yeah. I would push back on is 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 that um, the Communist Party has played a a really big influence, especially in the '30s. And the 40s before when when we go into world war ii that's when their influence begins to diminish afterwards but they did play a really good uh, uh role in popularizing communism at one point they had close to a million members and the founding of the communist party was the beginning of integrating radical socialist politics into a racial agenda it was the beginning of bringing into the socialist movement um uh, uh, black folks and black liberation up to that point the socialist party and the socialist labor party that were predominant at the end of the 19th century they weren't that successful even at the beginning of the founding of the communist party um the socialist party was still segregated right you had the when they had their meetings the people that were in the first floor were the whites the people in the second floor were, were the blacks i think i believe it's um what's this guy's name the black they call them the the black, well, I can't, I, I can't remember his name, but one of the famous Communist Party members, he mentions that the reason that he went into the Communist Party is because he passed through a Socialist Party meeting and he heard all these good ideas that he liked, but then he looked upstairs and he saw the black folks were upstairs and downstairs were, were, were the white folks. Um, and he didn't like that. So fr from the inception of, of the Communist Party in 1919, we do have the inclusion of, of black liberation and even there was this one black Marxist-Leninist movement. I think it's the International Brotherhood. So I don't remember the name. I have it in one of my last articles, but um, they were basically, they fell into the Communist Party. So um, the thing is that uh, there was big splits going on in geopolitics at the time. Uh, the Sino-Soviet split and, and there was some tension there. So uh, that not only brings a break in the Communist Party, but given that the Panthers were more so down the line of, of, of China and Mao, um, that could have also influenced how they saw the, the, the Communist Party because the Communist Party was a lot closer to um, the Communist Party 
and, and, and the Soviet Union. But I mean, those are those splits that we look back at now and it's like, come on, man, if, if, if CPUSA would have been able to work more with the Panthers, it would have been fantastic. Or even the, I mean, the Socialist Party or something. Yeah, but they just, they treated them as uh, outsiders. They treated them as, you know, as if they weren't true communists, which is just a ridiculous assertion to make because the amount of, the amount of things that they were accomplishing, um, it was just insane. Um, I mean, all across the United States, you see a Black Panther Party chapters popping up and they're all accomplishing their own things in their own ways uh, in each city, which it's just crazy because um, they, they were very connected, but then it also was a little more decentralized, um, which is, you know, uh, a lot different than, you know, the typical uh, Marxist communist experiment. Mm -hmm. And I'm the when I'm hearing about this, you know, my kind of just the way my brain works, I'm always trying to bring things to contemporary analysis, right? Like, how can we take what we learned from the past and use it today? today? And if you look at our situation today, you have a uh, three parties, you have DSA, PSL, and CPUSA, three tiny parties who are divided over seemingly minor issues. It's like, why are they not coming together as radical socialist communist parties? And then you have BLM, which is kind of this liberal petty bourgeois movement asking the cops, like, please be a little bit nicer towards people of color. And, you know, I've gone to BLM rallies, of course, of course I support it. Um, but they've, in a way, lost touch with the radical roots of, of Fred Hampton, Huey P. Newton, and the, you know, real radical socialist uh, people who really saw the intersectionality between um, the exploitation and oppression of people of color and capitalism, right? We've had a system that's been built um, on taking Black people um, uh, uh, over here on boats and, and making them slaves. And then after they got rid of slavery, you know, we had to have the whole civil rights movement and struggle just for basic human rights. And now we have the prison industrial complex throwing these people, um, throwing poor people and uh, especially people of color in jail. But what's the motive behind all of it is profit, right? And, and every BLM rally I went to, you know, they weren't explaining the prison industrial complex and how they profit off of essentially slave labor, paying these people less than a dollar an hour. And then you have telecom giants who are making tons of money, charging them 10 bucks an hour for a phone call or 10 bucks every 10 minutes for a freaking phone call as they're getting paid a dollar an hour. I mean, it's slavery. It's just, it gives us a way to justify it to say these guys committed a crime, they deserve it, but you don't have any unity. Um, and now I see people on Twitter calling like, there are people saying we need to completely abandon critical race theory if we want to get to the masses. Um, and I think, and you have like this paleo leftism of like, oh, we failed to get to the masses. We just needed to be more racist. It's like, no, we need to stop dividing ourselves over like the Sino Soviet split um, when we're here in the US, you know, and we've, we have, I feel like, our own tradition of socialism um, to meet US conditions, but it's kind of been buried and ignored. Um, like you said, uh, reading Huey P. Newton was a revelation for you. Um, uh, to read what what these civil rights leaders were saying. Um, and that's buried in American history. Um, but I wanted to also ask specifically, what was it about reading Huey P. Newton's book that caused you to change certain views that you had? So when it was when I was reading Revolutionary Suicide, one, just his life story was it. it it was just painful to read at times. Um, the things that he went through, um, seeing how he got to, you know, where he was. Uh, for instance, he didn't learn how to read until he was in his early 20s. How did he learn how to read? He pulled out a copy of Plato's The Republic and he sat and read it over and over again, word by word, looking up each word in the dictionary, months on end, hours a day, every day, until he learned how to read. He read that book so many times that he knew it inside out. Um, and like he taught himself to read. And then he taught him and he, you know, he struggled with it a lot, but, you know, cause it's, it's, that's something that's really hard to do once you're already in your twenties, you know? Um, and he figured it out cause he was just such an incredibly intelligent person. But even though my life story and his life story are, you know, vastly different, um, the way that he thinks, the way that his mind works, um, I, I connected with that a lot. Um, I saw a lot of similarities within like the way that he saw the world and the way that I see the world. Um, and I don't know, it just made sense to me. His analysis just made sense to me like nothing else I had ever read before. Um, it just, it just spoke to me on a level that no book I had ever read, um, uh, has done. 
Yes. And I want to ask too, you and I and Carlos too get accused of being tankies all the time, right? As if we're these uncritical supporters of all existing socialism. Um, so you talked about what Huey P said after visiting um, these existing socialist countries. So um, you want to talk about that a little bit and, and how that maybe made you change some of your theoretical positions? Or yeah, theory yeah. Positions? Um, so with revolutionary suicide, um, at the end of the book, he talks about visiting uh, the DPRK and he talks about visiting China. Um, but specifically with China, he talked about when he first got there, he said for the first time in his life, he felt like the police were there to protect him. They weren't there, you know, as an enemy. They were truly there for the people. It was, you know, they were there to serve the people, not there to, you know, uh, bring about fear and destruction and chaos. They were there for the sole purpose of protecting. And he felt safe for the first time. But also he talks about this with China and with Cuba because he lived in Cuba for a while because he had to escape the United States because, you know, he was wanted. Um, and uh, especially with Cuba, though, he talked about how he actually enjoyed labor for the first time in his life. He actually enjoyed working, even jobs he thought he never would have liked, you know, working as a mechanic, never something he thought he would have wanted to do, but he enjoyed it because his labor wasn't being exploited. His, he was able to, you know, reap the full benefits of his labor. He was able to just enjoy it and not have to worry about, you know, not being able to put food on the table if you don't work um, or if you don't work hard enough or if you can't keep a job. That's not something he had to worry about. But the same with China with their culture. Um, he just felt so incredibly connected to their culture um, and how everyone acted as a community. Um, and it wasn't this, you know, heavily individualistic society where, you know, people work together and people cared about the collective uh, more so than the individual, but um, just very interesting stuff. Yeah, yeah I think those recurring themes with, uh, with black revolutionaries when they visit um, what's called the real existing socialisms. Uh, you have Asada Shakir when she visits Cuba, she says similar things that, you know, it might not be fully non-racist, but it's getting there. It's working towards it. You have- um, And Cuba doesn't have systemic racism. You know, they have like problems with racism, but it's not a systemic, it's not at a systemic level. Yeah. They've, they've eliminated that. Of course, there are individuals who are racist, but um, the fact that they've done that is insane. Well, especially when, when these folks are going, it's at a time when Cuba has just finished developing the first post-revolution generation which means that generations from before the revolutions are still around with, um, with their specific biases and stuff. So yeah, like, like you said, there's no institutional racism, but you might still find, you know, certain issues here and there. But um, I mean, you find it with Paul Robeson, uh, he goes to the USSR and he says, you know, I feel like a man for the first time ever. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting um, how I've, I've continuously encountered a, as someone in, in academia, um, the modern radical uh, black tradition, which questions socialism as, as a tradition, as, a, as an escape, uh, as a form of liberation um, for the black community. And it's like, I mean, the experience that the leaders that we all look up to proves otherwise. It proves that whenever they go to these places, they love it, you know, they feel free for the first time ever. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it, it's, it proves that it's inherently contradictory to even think of a socialist project that includes the prejudices that you have in, in, in the US and in other capitalist countries, right? Um, to even achieve socialism, you need a level of unity and a level of, of, of dealing with those contradictions of prejudice that might be within the working class. In order to be successful, you have to deal with it. So once you are successful, that means you already dealt with it, right? It's not that only after socialism can we worry about issues of race, sex, and, and all of that, but in order to even get to it in the first place, you have to be engaging with those things, right? Yeah. Um, there's an interesting, uh, there's this one theorist, Domenico Losordo, who has this, uh, what he calls a pluralist reading of uh, the famous dictum from, from the manifesto, the history of all hierarchical existing societies is the history of class struggles. And that struggles, that pluralistic uh, way of interpreting that includes, you know, not just specifically economic class struggle, but sex and race and all these other forms of struggle within it. So it means that if we're striving for a classless society, already within that structure is the elimination of things like racism and sexism and stuff. 
but yeah, um, I think one of the uh, Adolf uh, Reed Jr. He has this one uh, text. It's a collection of essays, uh, class notes, and one of the things he starts with, I think it's it's a, it's a very important point, which is that there hasn't been a black radical movement in like 50 years. And he's writing this in the, the early 2000s, I believe, um, since the Panthers, right? What we've had with with black movements have been they've been movements, not organizations. Yeah, I think that's a big problem with the Black Lives Matter protests when comparing uh, which the Black Panther Party and the Black Lives Matter movement uh, as a whole are two very different things. But I think the reason why the Black Panther Party was able to do what they were able to do is because there, there was leadership. Their role was to educate. Um, that was a huge part of what they were doing. They would have the uh, children's breakfast programs and they would make the kids read. They would make them read, you know, Mao and Che Guevara. You know, um, they would open up health clinics and whenever they would have people volunteers, doctors, they would make the doctors sit down and read, you know, these Marxist theorists. Um, they, they were centered around education and organizing um, and of course arming. Um, you know, workers so that they can unite and actually fight back against, you know, not just capitalism, but the imperial core itself. Um, there were people in the community well, along because of all of that. There were people in the community could look up to. Um, that's one of the things that's completely missing, not just like in, in, in the black radical tradition we have now, which is that doesn't even seem like it came out of what we've had in, in, in the last 100 years, but just over on the left. Um, you have to real in order to play a vanguard role, you need people to buy into what you're doing. And in order for people to buy into what you're doing, you have to, in a way, you try to embody what you're trying, what you're aiming for. You have to be a virtuous person. You have to develop yourself. Um, and these are things that the Black Panther Party was doing, like I said, they had programs where they would teach theory, have political formation, physical formation, just the yeah, our modern they with their uniforms. Yep. Our, so, our modern left is um in in my opinion, and um, this is somewhat related, somewhat devoid of, of any idea of like we're gonna work hard, right? Because they say they say hard work is a product of capitalism. Carlos and I always say this. You see this capitalist memes like you gotta wake up and grind every day and invest in the stock market so you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's like uh, socialists look at that and they say, oh, that's stupid. It's telling you to work hard for capital. It's like, well, the ethic is right. You know, the there's nothing wrong with hard work. Um, it's the it's capitalism distorting it to tell you you have to work hard for money. And if you look at our history, if you look at Che and if you look at the Black Panthers, as Carlos was saying, they wanted to be these virtuous people who exemplified, you know, the kind of new man, as Che said, that they wanted to wanted to create and and they did have like you said they had structure um organization and leadership these things that kind of anarchists and decentralists seem to be against and, and don't even get me started on the post leftists you know all they seem to want to do is look at every little tiny aspect of capitalism and how it affects our culture and complain about it it's like okay well we can complain about it all day we can analyze all the horrible things that capitalism does but what are we going to do about it? And what the Black Panther said was exactly what you said. We're going to educate people and then we're going to meet their material needs. Um, so we're going to Which educate so them important. on why they're in poverty. Yes, <laughs> I mean, no, that's yeah. what we need to do. It's, it's, they had a, a, a big thing that they realized, um, which um, I'm, I'm going to read like a little short passage from To Die for the People. But uh, Huey was talking about how there were these underground organizations and he was talking about why they why that was problematic. And so he said, I responded to them by pointing out that you must establish your organization above ground so that people can relate to you in a way that will be positive and progressive for them. When you go underground without doing this, you bury yourself so deeply that the people can neither relate to you nor contact you. The original version of the party was to develop a lifeline to the people by serving their needs and defending them against their oppressors who come to the community in many forms from armed police to capitalist exploiters. We knew that this strategy would raise their conscious, raise the consciousness of the people and also give us their support. Then if we were driven underground by the oppressors, the people would support us and defend us. They would know that in spite of the interpretations of our only desire was to serve that their to serve their true interests and they would defend us because of this you have to meet people's material needs like their first thing was setting up the survival programs because how are you going to get people to fight for you and defend you if you haven't shown them that your primary interest is serving their true interests showing them that you are there to serve them you are there to support them you can't just be this underground movement that's decentralized the problem i've seen with 
the Black Lives Matter movement is that because it's decentralized, you have some cities where they're saying, where they're abolishing their police departments, literally abolishing their police departments. And you see in my city, you know, it's more, you know, calling for body cameras. Um, and so there is no uh, cohesive um, there. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's not very cohesive at all. Um, there is, there is no, there is no centralized message that they're trying to get across because it is so decentralized which is why I admire the Black Panther Party so much because they were able to organize and unite all of these different parts of the country under one umbrella in order to fight for, you know, their and, same movement. And I think so it's important, important to note too, obviously we don't want to be the condescending guys who tell everyone to read theory, but BLM isn't based on theory. So I think they miss things where, you know, the, the prison industrial complex is kind of what stems all these horrendous things you see with the justice system, right? Where the, where 24% of the world's prison population um, is in the U S because the cop's sole function is to, is to um, keep these prisons full. So they keep making money. So um, but it's hard to understand that if you don't have the theoretical backing. And if you look at the Black Panther Party, every single thing they did had theoretical backing. So they were teaching theory. They understood that a revolution needs to come from the masses, as, as Lenin said over and over again. You need to reach the masses. Um, and, and like you said, they were doing exactly that, meeting their material needs, being an above ground organization, um, speaking, uh, talking with their communities, educating their communities. Um, in order to spread class consciousness because they had this theoretical understanding within the group of what exactly they were trying to do. Um, and that made it a cohesive, cohesive movement. And that's, I agree, that's what we're lacking. And, um, and I mean, BLM, just basically what I'm saying is they're not a socialist movement and they need to be because as we we keep coming back to um, socialism is, is what really will liberate people of all, all colors. That's the thing about uh, trying to juxtapose them and compare like they're, completely different you know yeah um blm is like not <laughs> it's not searching for the liberation of humanity in the same way that the black panthers were because you know as as michael frenzy would say that there is if there is any theory it is abc theories anything but class theories um, <laughs> so there is no uh, marx has this famous quote from capital where he's like the white skin cannot liberate itself as long as it's black, uh, as long as the black one is branded, right? There could be no ultimate freedom for white folks if black folks are enslaved. But what the black radical tradition realized was that it was also the other way around, that there could be no freedom for uh, black folks. There could be no black liberation as long as you have uh, the white proletarian enslaved and, and the wage slave. So um, it's, it's about an emancipatory movement that includes all working folks, that includes lumpen elements, that includes poor people. Um, and that's that's not what BLM's goal was. And that was what the Black Panthers' goal was. They were able to make that connection. Um, Chandra, I think you made some great points in terms of organization. And I think this goes back to an age old debate between uh, uh, Lex Luxembourg and, and Lenin, uh, the spontaneity versus uh, organization and, and party. And the thing is that it's, it's not that um, just with, with, with party and organization, that's enough. Like life offers spontaneous opportunities that arise in different moments and you don't know when it's gonna arise. And yeah, it is in those moments when shit can happen, but shit can only happen if those, in, the, in those moments if you're already organized, if you're prepared to take advantage of those opportunities. And, and we, we've had such a year that if we had a strong socialist party or communist party or a strong organized, centrally organized movement, we would have been able to take advantage of this year like no other before. And the fact that nothing has really arisen from this year just demonstrates the lack, the complete lack of organization that we have. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, a big problem that I see is that typically it's two camps arguing with one another and those two camps are usually, you know, uh, class reductionist communists, which class reductionism is, I mean, it's honestly for fools. It, it completely leaves race out of the analysis and you cannot analyze the conditions in the United States right now without including race in your analysis. Because in the United States, like race isn't just, like racism isn't just a tool that capitalism uses. It's, it's something that is a core aspect uh, of the United States, of the imperial core. These are two problems that are side by side that need to be you know, attacked 
about both at the same time. And that's what the Black Panther Party did so well, because they realized that capitalism was what was enabling all of these things, but that these things also exist outside of capitalism. And so they both need to be taken down at the same time. You can't just focus on one. So you see with the other camp, it's, you know, uh, people who typically when it comes to like neo the neoliberal co-optation of identity politics, because identity politics is actually really radical and it's a really cool idea, but it was co-opted by neoliberalism. And, you know, when it was co-opted by neoliberalism, it basically just took that analysis and like took race, out, uh, took class out of the equation. And so you have, you know, a camp that thinks everything is only class and you have a camp that thinks everything is only race when in reality it's more nuanced than that. We have to approach it, you know, that's, that's why I loved Huey P. Newton so much because he was such a dialect, like he was such, such a, such a strict dialectical materialist. Uh, every decision he made, he made after contemplating on it for a long period of time, after thinking about every single aspect of the situation at hand, and he used dialectical materialism thoroughly throughout his approach. And I think that's what enabled them to accomplish so much because they were able to realize that there are more than, there's more than just one problem that we have to take on. There are all of these problems and everything is interconnected and that's dialectics in general. Um, but if you, you know, reduce everything to, we have one problem we have to take out and that's it, then you're viewing one thing in isolation. You're viewing, you know, this one issue in a vacuum, which is dogmatism. You have to view everything in its uh, in its connection to one another. But yeah, yeah. Carlos and I see such a failure right now among the left of, um, you know, they like the aesthetic of Marxism, but they struggle so hard to actually apply dialectical materialism. And I would suggest everyone check out Luna Oi has a video on how how to use dialectical materialism in your own thinking, which is something that I feel like almost no one is doing, which is how you end up with all these goofy takes, like either the, the liberal people calling themselves socialists who are hyper obsessed with identity politics, and then these paleo class reductionists who are saying, let's ignore all racial elements that exist in the US, a country founded on systemic racism. And it's like, well, that's not materialist. You're not then analyzing the conditions that exist in the U.S. correctly, um, which, you know, which include, which would be intersectionality, which would be, as I'm saying for the hundredth time now, the intersection between race and class and understanding that to liberate one of these things, we also need to include the other thing. Um, and yeah, it's, there's a lot of idealism and, and people struggle to m interpret the material conditions, I think. Yeah, this is this is also uh, an amazing book. If you want to get more into dialectical materialism, it's called The Principal Contradiction, uh, and it talks about it talks about dialectical materialism a lot and how to analyze and identify the principal contradiction in the world. Um, and it's an amazing read. It's really short. If any of y'all ever want to check it out, but yeah, absolutely. for sure. And I will, I'll point out we also have uh, since we're recommending stuff, we have quite a few videos on materialism and dialectics now done by Carlos, who's getting his master's in philosophy there. So you can check those out as well if, if you don't know what we're talking about when we say dialectical materialism. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, do we want to touch on, I think uh, perhaps one of the, one of the most unique, uh, unique things that comes out of the book and that's what the, what the book title is, Revolutionary Suicide. Um, and the distinction between revolutionary and reactionary suicide. Um, do you want to explain what uh, what he means by that, Chandler? I have the, the passage yeah, the yeah. where he talks about it. I don't know if, if it'd be helpful to read the, the last two two paragraphs where, where he talks about that. Or what. Yeah, no, go ahead if you want to read it, yeah. All right, so... Um, he says, there's another illuminating story of the wise man and the fool found in Mao's Little Red Book. A foolish old man went to the North Mountain and began to dig. A wise old man passed by and said, why do you dig, foolish old man? Do you not know that you cannot move the mountain with a little shovel? But the foolish old man answered, resoundly, uh, while the mountain cannot get any higher, it will get lower with each shovel. When I pass on, my sons and his sons and his sons will go on making the mountain lower. Why can't we move the mountain? Uh, the foolish old man kept digging and the generations that followed him after 
And the wise old man looked on in disgust. But the resoluteness and the spirit of the generations that followed the foolish old man touched God's heart. And God sent two angels who put the mountains on their backs and moved the mountain. This is the story Mao told. When he spoke of God, he meant 600 million who helped move the mountain of imperialism and bourgeois thinking, the two great mountains. The reactionary suicide is wise, and the revolutionary suicide is a fool, a fool for the revolution in a, a fool for the revolution in the way that Paul meant when he spoke of being a fool for Christ. That foolishness can move the mountain of oppression. It is our great leap and our commitment to the dead and to the unborn. We will touch God's heart when we will touch when we will when we will touch the people's hearts and together we will move the mountain. I mean, it's 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 presented beautifully in the prose of, of Mao's poetics, um, but I I think that's that's a fantastic analysis because uh, the the reactionary suicide is presented as as the wise. You know, it's the person that's always calculating. And I think if we if we compare it to this recent event that happened with the force the vote situation, how many wise folks were like starting to calculate all sorts of stuff in order to prove that it was a bad move to, to try to do the force the vote or whatever, right? The revolutionary suicide looks foolish, right? It looks like, oh no, that's not the smart thing. You can't move a mountain, right? Um, but you still do it, you participate in it because it's something that transcends you, right? And what I'm scared of is that we, we have a left that's so, uh, that has the individualism of capitalism so inscribed into their ethos, right? Into their being that they can't think of anything that's outside themselves. They really, they seem to struggle in the process of thinking of some form of transcending, transcendence of, of the ego. Um, and if it's not something that, that seems like it's immediately uh, acquirable, there is no goal in, 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 in just that constant move forward, right? Um, I don't know, what do you guys think? Um, yeah, no, um, and, and just to touch on the concept of revolutionary suicide more, I think um, it's best exemplified too by, I mean, the title of this book, which is a, you know, a collection of QE speeches and essays, and it's just to die for people. You know, um, you look at revolutionary suicide and it is dying for the revolution, dying, like not letting, you know, your life be taken from you uh, from reactionary reasons, you know, uh, not dying a reactionary death, which is anything except dying for a revolutionary cause. Um, you know, uh, he talks, he uses examples a lot in revolutionary suicide, uh, using Eldridge Cleaver as an example of reactionary suicide. Um, and, um, if, if y'all don't know much about, uh, Eldridge Cleaver, yeah, there was a, a rift in the party and Eldridge Cleaver, um, essentially started attacking a lot of the Panthers saying that they were too focused on the survival programs. They were too focused on educating people that they just need to pick up the gun and start the revolution. And Huey tried to explain and say, no, like we need to get the people on our side first. We just pick up the gun and just start attacking. We're going to get gunned down and we're going to die immediately. That's what happened for the first, you know, couple of years uh, in, the, in the initial phases of the Black Panther Party. And so they started focusing more on the survival programs and Eldridge Cleaver um, had reactionary reasons. And later on, Eldridge Cleaver went on to become a Republican. Um, and, you know, you really do see that he does uh, and th th this isn't even something that Huey ever got to see, but Eldridge Cleaver really did completely fall in, into reactionary uh, beliefs, while Huey did um, ultimately die a revolutionary suicide, uh, die a death of revolutionary suicide. And that's what we need to do. We need to realize that the, our, our sole purpose of being here, our sole purpose, our sole purpose in life should be improving the conditions of the people around us, of the people that we love, and of building a better world and not sitting back and just allowing, you know, the exploiting class to exploit everyone, to oppress everyone. Yes, that that uh, passage you read, Carlos, it made me think of, um, and your analysis there, Chandler, it made me think of Che, um, who obviously took, took those same writings to heart, you know, and had the same idea of like, 
dedicating yourself to move a mountain that seems immovable. And that was all of Che's life, you know, being one of the most successful revolutionaries we've had, obviously different situation than the Black Panthers who were facing the U.S. Um, death machine. Um, and Che was clear that that job is much harder and much more important, our job in the Imperial Corps to take, up, take down the empire. But it was, they did the revolution in Cuba with 22 people, right? He went in willing to die. And after that, you know, everyone was like, well, hold on, Che, let's, let's not do any more revolution. He's like, no, we need to continue moving the mountain of imperialism. Um, and, and I'm going to the Congo because Cuba wasn't doing what he wanted. They were trying to build socialism, sell their sugar and tobacco to the Soviet Union and establish socialism, which who can blame them for that, right? I mean, they were under U.S. embargo. The CIA was trying to kill them every day. And Che's like, well, we need to move this mountain of imperialism off of Latin America and off of Africa. So he goes to the Congo and it's a disaster, it completely fails. And he goes back to Cuba and he's like, all right, now I'm going to Bolivia, which is eventually where same, you know, he's killed. Like we said, he gives his life for the revolution. He, he continues giving all his everything towards fighting, um, fighting imperialism and fighting private capital to the death. Um, and he talks about his concept of a new man, um, of releasing individualism and giving yourself fully as you were explaining Chandler to the people around you to bettering the lives of the people around you and I think you know this is a little bit of a side note but people talk about finding happiness under capitalism for me that's where I derive a lot of my joy in life is fighting with in community with you know people like you two who two people I really enjoyed speaking with and respect to move this mountain of imperialism, to create a better society for those who will live after us, even if we never get to see it. Um, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. That, that amazing you, That's uh, interesting that you bring that up um, with Che going on to fight in other revolutions because that actually ties into um, basically he hadn't developed uh, this theoretical framework um, at the time. Revolutionary suicide was released. This is something he worked on later, but. but was theory of uh, global intercommunalism and how uh, he, he basically just postulated that we need to work with the global South. We need to work with the nations that are most exploited by the United States. And if we can work with them to allow their revolutionary movements to reach a point to where they're successful, we can cut the United States off from their resources and only then can the final blow be dealt to the Imperial Corps from the inner workings of it, you know, from the inside, uh, from a party at the time like the Black Panther Party, but today that can be any movement that takes off. And that's why it's so important that we be international, but how Huey framed it was that the, the US is no longer a nation and no, na no nation exists because no one is sovereign under the US empire anyone steps out of line and the U.S. steps in and, you know, does what they want to do. If anyone does something the U.S. doesn't like, they have the power to stop them. Um, and how we really aren't uh, a community of nations anymore. We are just interconnected communities. And as communities, we have to unite together against the Imperial Corps and especially, especially inside the Imperial Corps, um, which is, you know, us uh, American citizens. And it's so yeah, huge to think of so, in the moment. Can I say one thing quick, yeah, Carlos? Because yeah. it's going to be like one second, then you can go. The analogy I was using in my imperialism guide by Lenin is like a vice. So you have the labor and the communist movement in America, and then you have the peripheries of all these you know, countries in the global south who are also looking to crush private capital. And the goal is to crush it like a vice in between the, the people's proletarian movements internationally and here at home, um, crush that imperialist private capital. Um, so internationalism is important. Yeah, but go ahead, Carlos. Yeah, I was just going to say that that's a, another thing that, you know, is no longer around in the left, <laughs> an anti-imperialist sentiment. Um, we have, and I think it was uh, either the 2019 or 2018, um, I don't even remember now, but uh, 2020 doesn't even feel like a year. It just feels like we skipped, we skipped the year. But um, one of the socialist conferences in Chicago, you had uh, you had people basically pushing regime change in in Venezuela and in Cuba. Uh, and and these were people that were funded by the humanitarian organizations that that the State Department funds, right? Um, and that that wasn't really that wasn't really the case in. in in the Black Panther Party, you know, everyone was clearly anti-imperialist. Um, 
we can't say that's the same for the biggest leftist organization now, you know, DSA. DSA is not a party, but um, they are the biggest organization we have. They're like 90,000 people. And I think probably at least half of them, uh, if you ask them, hey, what are your thoughts on Cuba? They're going to say an answer that's quite similar to what the State Department would say. Um, yeah. And that's that's pretty sad. It's very sad because it, it it's it's just odd that, um you know, um, a lot of leftist movements in the U.S. now are not rooted in anti-imperialism and anti-colonialism because there does exist a labor aristocracy where the workers in the global south are exploited to a much higher degree than workers within the imperial core. You know, there 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 is a relative amount of privilege that, um, you know, the proletarian movements in the United States have in comparison to that of the worker movements in the global south. Um, and if we don't work with them, then we're not going to be able to overthrow capitalism because they don't, they've proven time again, you look at these social democracies, they don't need the workers from within inside their, with inside their borders uh, to, you know, keep making profit. They can just export that exploitation to another country. So if we don't work with countries in the global south, if we don't make this a movement that's founded in anti, anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism, then we're never going to be successful. If we just look at it uh, from an isolate, isolationist point of view, yeah, we'll never succeed. We'll constantly fail. I mean, imagine if a member of the Chinese Communist Party, which is 90 billion members, saw the conversation we got in on Twitter recently with people who call themselves communists. Who are, who are, what? Did not, I say 90 not, billion? Yeah, I always do that. That's a bit much. <laughs> Sorry. It's all the same. Just kidding. But um, <laughs> that was 90 million members of the Chinese Communist Party. I'm pretty sure that we would have had that socialism a while. Ago. Communism. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, imagine we're talking about building internationalism. So you have 90 million members of the Communist Party, um, you know, and obviously everyone has their critiques of China. But you have people in the U.S. who call themselves communists in the U.S., the imperial core who's destroying every proletarian movement around the world saying China's garbage and we need to sanction them. You know, as Carlos said, we have communists repeating the State Department line. It's like, how are you expecting to build internationalism if every time the hegemonic U.S. media says, ooh, we need to sh- sanction China, you know, their leader's the new Hitler, believe us this time, we're serious. Um, and then we have communists eating it up. You know, like I'd say most communists are anti-China. And it's like, okay, I don't care if you're anti-Xi Jinping. I don't care if you're mad about what's going on in Xinjiang. But there are 90 million members of the Chinese Communist Party who have done a hell of a lot more for for advancing proletariat, you know, the the international proletariat than fucking what America's doing right now. Obviously, we're the most disgusting, grotesque, bourgeois, uh, imperialist state in the world. So um, there's really a lack of anti-imperialism. There's really a lack of media literacy. Two people just fall into these narratives when they're largely propagated. Um, and yeah, we need to root that like, okay, be critical of China. But when you take it to the point of supporting sanctions from the U.S. State Department, you're not even on the left anymore. You know, you're being a neo. Yeah. Um, and these are the if same you, people if you that support, would say that you, it's okay to support the Democratic Party here. These are the same ones that are like, yeah, you got to vote Biden. You know, you got to do this. You got to participate. So you can participate in the party or one of the two parties that's leaving, leading the pillage of the world and bombing brown people all over the world. But if you are taking a critically supportive position of China, oh boy, that's where you messed up. <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy because I don't think you can call yourself a communist if you support the US over any country, any country, regardless of whether they're socialists or not, if there's a country that's working towards tearing down U.S. hegemony, then I will cr- I'll critically support them to what degree I do. That depends. But I will support any country over the United States any day. Um, that's not a question. And if you support the United States over experiments that you th- over these countries that are saying we are fighting for socialism, whether or not you believe them, that's up to you. But how are you going to go on and support the United States who just relishes in capitalism and and flaunts it and goes around and, you know, tears down uh, different governments every time they step out of line, every time they disagree with anything 
United States wants to do. If they want to nationalize their industries, the United States comes in and overthrows their government and puts in, especially one of the worst examples, and I, I know you've talked about this a lot, with Chile, with Pinochet. They, put, they took out Allende and put Pinochet in power, one of the worst dictators of the 20th century. And they act like it's about democracy, and it's not. You can't you can't support the United States and call yourself a communist. It's it's a contradiction. It 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 doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and and to specifically the person I was arguing with on Twitter, MJ, and I love MJ, and he's young. He's just becoming a communist, and and it is easy to buy into these narratives of that the U.S. puts out. But he's talking about Xinjiang, and he's saying I support sanctions. Um, and I I pulled up an article of Iran that got a lot of traction on Twitter, and it says Iranians say sanctions hurt people, not government. Of course they do, because because you need to understand the U.S. State Department is not sitting around all day thinking how do we combat human rights abuses in Xinjiang they're thinking how can we overthrow the Chinese Communist Party and let it become a capitalist hellscape like most of the rest of the world um, and and like Carlos and I have repeated over and over and over again we don't support the fact that Xinjiang's a surveillance state we don't support the fact that there's re-education camps going on we just realize that if you dig into it one it's not genocide and calling it genocide is honestly offensive to real victims of genocide. And two, sanctions aren't going to magically make the surveillance state disappear. It's going to make um, Uyghurs poorer. It's going to make the region they live in more poor because they're now going to be blocked off from the rest of the world. So as a socialist, why are you supporting an act that's going to make the, inter a pro you know, the international proletariat more poor or, or make their job and their lives harder? Um, and, and it's just, I think it's a little bit of naivety and there's a, um, it's difficult because of how hegemonic our media is and, and how bad our education system is. But I just want to encourage you, if you're watching this, just think, um, think about these things really hard before you share your opinion on other countries and recognize how bad our media is. Like for me, it was doing my Venezuela paper. I was like, wow, like we have no idea what's going on over there. Our media is straight up falsifying information, just pure lies or they'll take the smallest little thing and blow it up like it's the biggest deal and ignore all the major factors that are actually influencing things in the country um so just recognize how bad our media is i guess and recognize the u.s state department is a tool of private capital they do nothing yeah. because they care about human rights no and it's 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 honestly ridiculous to assert that the u.s cares anything about human rights uh in China right now, because there have been U.S. government officials who have come out openly admitting that the U.S. has been like they have been responsible for a lot of the things they've been funding a lot of the things that are going on in China right now to create divisions. So why would they want to come in and do anything to protect people's human rights when they are the ones behind a lot of the a lot of the things that are going on right now? A lot of these issues that we talk about, the U.S. is puppeteering a lot of this. That, you know, they're controlling a lot of these situations. Why would they, of all countries, care about human rights? They, they don't. They don't at all. It's, it's just ridiculous to even assert something like that because they truly do not care about human rights. To criticize China is one thing, and it needs to be done. We, as communists, we have to criticize socialist experiments that are existing and previously existing. But if you are going to come in and then act like the United States is the good guy and they're going to come in and fix the problem, I would just like you to point out a singular point in history where the U.S. has intervened in the affairs of another nation and made things better because they haven't. <laughs> they never have. Right. Maybe it's not better after, <laughs> after our intervention there with the literal fucking uh, slave market but yeah i mean this gets back to the text um uh one of the things you just mentioned it's is criticism um the necessity to criticize uh, social states um because with criticism there's growth and the one of the last chapters of the text um huey when huey goes to china he's talking about how fantastic it is and they're basically begging him like please give us a criticism please and he's like i, I don't know what to say and eventually he ends up telling them, well, you know, there's there's a pollution issue with the way you guys are, are, are producing. Um, and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're basically dealing with it. We have plans to deal with that in the future. But that effort of criticism, that's what that's what people don't understand. You know, you tune into a, in Cuba, it's called La Mesa Redonda, where they analyze the situation that's going on. And they're extremely critical about themselves. And they're always engaging with the criticisms that 
you know, even Gusano from Miami are saying, like every time you listen to a speech from uh, Diaz Canel, he's always saying, well, now they're saying this because of our policy about the dollar. This is how it's, it, they, they're always engaging with criticism. And the media makes it seem like these countries are just like these totalitarian states that get any sort of criticism. And if, if you criticize them in any way, you're, you know, you're, you're thrown in a dungeon or something or killed. And it's, that's not the case. They're the most critical against themselves because they realize that in order to grow, in order to fix their own contradictions, they have to be critical. Yeah, and they in don't this understand. book. Oh, wait, wait, what were you saying? I was just gonna say this book, The Governance of China, Xi Jinping's book. And like, obviously we have our critiques of Xi Jinping, but if you read the book, you realize like 200 pages of the 500 are him critiquing China and saying, this is what we need to do better. It's like, they're, the countries themselves recognize these things, but then you have Western leftists like, no, you're all bad over there. I'm gonna encourage the US to put sanctions on you so you'll be better. It's like, that's so chauvinistic. You know, they're critical of themselves. Yeah, and, and one thing people don't usually talk about is when they say, oh, well, in the United States, you can critique the government. Like right now we are critiquing the government. The reason is they, the US does have hegemony right now complete like they don't need to worry about a couple of people speaking out against the government they aren't constantly being attacked from every single angle they are the ones doing all of the attacking but then when you look at people who leak like you look at edward snowden you look at people who leak information that's truly critiquing what the united states is doing and they do attack them for it viciously they treat them worse than the bankers on wall street who scam the entire country no, yeah, they don't do anything to them. But then you look at people like Edward Snowden and look what look what's going on with him right now. You know, he can't even come back to this, to this country. He can't because he all he did was leak information that was just proving that the U.S. was doing highly illegal things. And, and it's just ridiculous. And what, and what information did he, Edward Snowden leak? He leaked that the NSA can go on your phone and start and do anything it wants without you even noticing that they're doing it. They could be taking a video. They could be harvesting all your data. And what are what is everyone in the U.S. freaking out about China? You know, oh, China spies on their people. Oh, they're authoritarian. What the hell do you call the NSA? And then when someone reveals what the NSA is doing, the U.S. persecutes them and tries to put them in jail for life. Or like Assange, he's literally losing his mind because they've done so much psychological warfare and he's been holed up in solitary confinement um so it's like even the things that we criticize other countries for we're guilty of and you know of course you have the the gulag criticisms and the prison camp criticisms no socialist of course we don't support prison camps but look at the u.s 24.4 or whatever percent of the world's prison populations here and it's a profit-driven industry and they do slave labor where they pay their their workers less than a dollar an hour i mean we we always, in the gulags, they literally paid them a, min, a living wage, um, which of course we don't want to bring back gulags. No, we don't support gulags, but you have Westerners looking, you know, looking down their nose at these other countries who have attempted to establish socialism when everything, you know, it's all projection of just stuff that yeah. also goes on here. And with the, yeah. the, belt, the belt initiative that, um, that China's doing basically uh, around the world, but specifically uh, in Africa, um, they look at that, and like you just said, I think you mentioned it perfectly. There's, it's a projection of what we do. And the, the criticisms that the U.S. gives to China and with the sort of trade that China's doing in Africa is basically what the U.S. through the IMF and the World Bank has been doing the last 70 years. <laughs> so it's so hypocritical. But like you said, Chandler, they have such a hegemony that they allow this sort of discourse and they even benefit from this sort of discourse because then they can be like, look, no, we let people criticize because <laughs> we have no power. As soon as we get the slightest bit of power, Eddie's gone. <laughs> <Chandler's> gone. <laughs> so, They're so good at disappearing people. They do it all the time. That's when I'll the- turn to Adorno and I'll become an armchair Marxist when they start <laughs> disappearing the people around me. So, yeah. Yeah, no, they don't, they don't do anything about, you know, um, just an average person critiquing the government's actions because yeah, we don't have any power whatsoever. But as soon as you see someone like Snowden who has some kind of power and then uses that to critique the United States, they treat them like, you know, the worst criminal on the face of the earth. Um, You know, the the way that, you know, um, the, the way that these people have been treated is just ridiculous. And then for 
people, to, especially when you're talking about the gulags uh, and the prison industrial complex, it is important to critique uh, countries like the Soviet Union um, for their use of prison camps. This isn't something that we want to support. This isn't something that we want to see continue. But the thing is, if you are critiquing countries like the Soviet Union, yeah, from a point of view of the United States, if you are comparing the two and acting like the United States is good, then that's ridiculous. That is completely and utterly ridiculous because the United States is worse by nearly every metric. And if you're going to critique, if you're going to critique these gulags, you know, just from the point of view that, yes, the United States is worse, but this is also bad and we need to critique this, that's not a problem. That's encouraged. We need to do that. But if you're going to contrast that with the United States and our prison industrial complex, it's way worse. It's way worse here. Every time there's ever a critique of a socialist experiment, I can name a time the United States has done that same thing, but to a much, much worse degree than any of these socialist experiments have. It's ridiculous. It's Nothing true. It's like Hakeem so says, it's all projection. You know, what people claim is wrong with socialist countries is just what is going on also in capitalist countries, even, you know, when they critique the Soviet bureaucracy. Another thing me and Carlos and, and Che Guevara were highly critical of, you know, capitalism has huge bureaucracy, especially with things like health insurance, where it's a freaking hassle and a half to make sure that that you have health insurance you got to fill out pounds of paperwork and there's all these bureaucrats who are are, are designed to make the system run um and it's all just projection were you gonna say something the bread about? lines too they bring up the bread lines all the time say so look at the bread lines in the soviet <laughs> Union. that's literally happening today that's happening today here and they're not even working people are starving yeah and that's that's uh, that's one of the things that I think that uh, Parenti brings up in, in black shirts and reds, the people that would be critical of like the bureaucracy in the Soviet Union when they came to the U.S. They're like, holy shit, it's worse. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, it's like you're saying, Chandler, it's um, when you're looking at, this, say, the Soviet Union, just because it's you know, perhaps the, the biggest experiment um, or the biggest fall experiment. Um, when, when you're looking at it from the perspective of the US, there's two things. First of all, everything that we point there, we are doing as well, but worse, which is the element of projection. But second of all, why are we looking at another country in another side of the world with our values? That's not materialist. You have to look at the Soviet Union and interpret it with their values, with how it was before it became the Soviet Union. And if you think about how repression functioned in Tsarist Russia and how repression function in, in the Soviet Union, it was a lot less. And when you think about the, the sphere of freedom in Tsarist Russia and the sphere of freedom in, in the Soviet Union, it was a lot more. Oh yeah. No, it, it's, it's, it's crazy because you look at the Soviet Union and within less than a century, they went from being a feudal society to being the first nation to send someone to space, to developing the first satellite, they developed the first mobile telephone, they developed all of these things, but then they also use the argument that socialism is no, is, and no innovation. There's no innovation under socialism. But then there's all of these examples of innovation. Some of the highest points of innovation that we have reached in the history of humanity developed by socialist experiments, but no, no, socialism is no innovation. 80% of books, I think during the, the, the after World War II to the 70s, where were published in, in, in uh, the Soviet Union. 80% of books in the world. Jeez. Yeah. yeah, it's, there's a lack of an ability to compare these countries. And, and part of it too is like how we're trained to think in the US, that's the other thing. Like we're really highly critical of Western leftists, but you're brought up to think a certain way since birth. And it's, let's compare Cuba, this tiny island that's been under an embargo for 60 years to the United States and be like, oh, they don't have as many consumer goods and the paint's peeling off the walls. So um, therefore socialism doesn't work. It's like, well, what did they have before? They had a military dictatorship and Western plantations owned everything and they had slave peasants. And I love the book Che that I just finished, but John Lee Anderson, the author is a Westerner and not a Marxist, great biographer, but he says in Havana, after the revolution, there's less freedom because the brothels are gone, the prostitutes are gone, and the nightclubs are gone, and it's replaced with the Cuban army training for when the CIA comes to invade. And he go, he said, makes a comment like, now there was less freedom post-revolution. It's like, well, freedom for who? There's less freedom for you, the Western tourist, 
but I'm pretty sure the the peasants who before the revolution were fucking slaves have more freedom now that they're not slaves. <laughs> um, so there's an inability to compare these countries to what they had before. Same with Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, you know, teaching everyone to read, building all these free health clinics, you know, compared to what they had before, it, it's miles ahead. You know, the, the idea that socialism hasn't worked is, is laughable. Central planning and nationalization of industry has, has taught millions to read and, and, you know, built hundreds of thousands of hospitals, trained hundreds of thousands of doctors. Um, Specifically yeah. with Cuba, um, it, it's, it's just crazy because people act like, oh, they were super repressive and they just murdered everyone who was a part of the bourgeoisie. The reason that we have these opinions uh, that we you know, have about Cuba in the United States is because the initial wave of people who fled Cuba were members of the bourgeoisie, were high ranking military officials and Castro literally said, I don't wanna kill all of you, this is over. I will literally fly you to the United States personally where they're offering you citizenship and then you can go live there if you don't like socialism go do that. And they did. And so everyone who left in the, in the beginning and in the initial phases of the, you know, uh, establishment of a socialist society in Cuba, the people who were leaving were the people who benefited the most from the Batista regime. So of course, a lot yes. of the, well, not only that, people that, that first wave positive of positive opinions of Batista and negative opinions of socialism. That first wave. Yeah. Of uh, can I... uh, yeah, go, go. Oh, sorry, I'll be, uh, mine's quick. I just want to add on Che invited, because it, it makes Chandler's point, Che invited the wealthiest plantation owner in all of Cuba before they went ahead with the land reforms and took his land. He said, Che said, um, we're not going to let you keep your land. We're not going to let you keep your money, but we'll give you a workman's wage and you can stay here in Cuba and, and you can you can be one of the socialist workers. You know, even the wealthiest plantation owner, they didn't just kill him. They said, hey, join socialism, become a good guy. And the guy said no. And he, and he went to Miami. Yeah, well, that generation that went to Miami, um, this is something that very few people know, but um, they stole the, the gold reserves that Cuba had. So the whole basis of the monetary system of the country, which was gold, they stole it. Um, so they, they did pretty well in the land of opportunities, right? Um, if you come with a shitload of gold, you're, you're probably going to do pretty good. Another thing <laughs> is that the people that, that were killed, because there, there were people that were killed, but um, people don't know that there was literal terrorism going on. Um, the first, one of the first things a revolution would do was send squadrons of people. My grandpa was amongst one of them but squadrons of people to the campesinos, to, to the country, to create hospitals, uh, small little clinics and, and, and little schools. And what the opposition would do, which was funded by, by the US and, and specifically the CIA, they would basically intercept these groups of 17, 18, 19 year olds and massacre them. There was this one literal walkway that last time I went to Cuba, I had to pass by, that was, uh, it's, it's a tree walkway and they told you, don't look up because if you get cursed, right? Why? Because they used to literally hang people there that would go with the squadrons to go help people because the terrorists would go in. And these were the people that were killed. And what country wouldn't kill people who do that or at least throw them in prison for at least 20 years, you know? They were um, fighting a revolution. It's a war. Like, what do you expect to happen? It's not this peaceful thing. People are like, they killed people. Well, yeah. People will say like, oh, Che killed people. I think there's like one or two accounts of Che like personally executing someone. People will be like, he's a horrible person. It's like, okay, well, what about George Washington? Do you view him as a horrible person? Because if you look at the Seven Years' War, he executed personally like around, I think it was around a dozen French, uh, <laughs> like French ambassadors. He personally executed them. So are you going to go on to say that He's evil. No, they're going to defend him. Even though George Washington literally owned slaves, was this <laughs> brutal slave owner, was this horrible person. They'll defend him, but then they'll act like Che was evil for killing slave owners. People are, have an inability to put the shoe on the other foot with, like you said, one, they were overthrowing slave owners. And then Carlos said, two, there were terrorists running around in the Escombray, heavily funded in the Sierra Maestra heavily funded by the CIA massacring people. So the military, the Cuban military and volunteer soldiers went out there and fought them to make sure that Cuba could build hospitals in the rural areas where there were no hospitals before. Um, and like, imagine that happens in the US. 
imagine, you know, I always use this with Iran. Like imagine if Iran did the stuff that we do to them, but imagine if there's terrorist guerrilla groups sponsored by a different country running around in our country, massacring people, trying to build hospitals. You think people in the U S would be like, ah, we should let them go for human rights. Like get the hell out of here. But nobody has the ability to do that. And, and Chomsky has something on that where it's like, it's literally impossible for really chauvinist Americans to even think like, the stuff we do to other countries, they can't even imagine it on the other foot. And there's a good Mehdi Hassan interview where he's asking a guy over and over again. I think they're talking about Iran or Iraq or something. I don't know. But he's like, imagine if Iran massacred our general, murdered our general. How would we react like we did to Soleimani? And the guy's like, oh, that would never happen. The U.S. is too powerful. And Mehdi's like, yeah, but what if it did? And the guy's like, it wouldn't. The U.S. is too powerful. He physically can't in his own head put the shoe on the other foot and imagine what the U.S. does all the time another country would dare to do to us, you know, because he's got it in his head that we are the world police, we are just better, and, and it's a racist attitude, and it's a, a, a bourgeois attitude. Um, One of the yeah. things that W.A.B. Du Bois does, and I think Fanon does it pretty nicely too, is look at the First World War, and at the time that it happened, I mean, the West was so shocked. They were like, how is this happening, you know? Uh, and the way they, they saw it was that, well, this is just the West doing to each other what they've done to the third world this whole time, right? So it, really, it, it sort of materially forced them to put the shoe on the other foot and they were like, oh my God, like, you know, how could this be? Um, I, the same way you can interpret the same uh, World War II in, in, in a similar way. But yeah, it's just that inability to even conceive of, like it, there's a epistemic impossibility to even think of what would happen if it was the other way around. Um, and, and again, this is not just the State Department media. This is the left, most of the left, um, the way most of the left thinks. So um, not to bring up fucking Jordan Peterson. I, I hate him. And I don't think I've ever watched one of his videos. Um, but I've, I've heard him in, in the, the speech with Shishak mentioned, you know, cleaning up your own house. And in our case, we really do have to clean up our own house. We do have to have a complete character shift of the spirit of what is the left in the U.S. before we can even have the conditions for the possibility of anything. And that sounds very Kantian of me, <laughs> but um, we do have to completely change the way we are in order to even think about having something. You know, uh, Lenin famously in, in, in um, uh, left-wing communism and fan disorder has this famous phrase of going where the masses are, right? Going where the masses are. I mean, if we go in the shape we're in, where the masses are, we ain't doing shit either way, you know? <laughs> you think any of the working class people in this country are going to follow what the average person in the left uh, is, you know? Uh, we do have to change ourselves and be the sorts of people that other people can follow and that other people can look up to, right? So in that sense, we do have to clean our house first in order for us to go outside and then change the world. Yeah, we have to be people that the masses can connect with. Um, and Huey talks about that a lot, too. We can't be these, like, underground, like, vague, abstract figures who, you know, champion these ideas that are also abstract. No, we need to show them, hey, we, we directly want to help you. We, we want to improve your conditions. We want to make sure that you are fed, that you have a place to sleep, that you have education, that your children have education, that you don't have to worry about survival because you can do that, that's when you show that one we care about you and that's how you earn people's trust and respect and two that is how you get to the point where they'll listen to you about education and educating people is so important because if we don't educate people then they're never going to support these ideas it needs to the revolutionary movement needs to be based in educating the masses because if the people aren't educated then they're not going to know what they're fighting for and it'll be easy for people to slip back into reactionary ways uh, of thinking about the world and the like it can be as simple as being nice like i see so many people on tiktok who are stunned by me and chandler so like wow you guys are just so nice I'm like, wow, that's really surprising to you that we don't treat people like shit. It's like, that's what the baseline, what you should be doing is a revolutionary, right? And you have this big, as you said, these people, these abstract underground thinkers, these people who are egoists, you know, who, who are obsessed with their own 
their the machinations of their own mind rather than just being kind to people in order to build up the con kind of connection and class consciousness we need um to eventually have a revolution and, and yeah i mean that that seems like the simplest advice it's what you learn in grade school but yeah and, and there's people who say you know social norms are a product of capitalism and like maybe but but humans just want to be connected right that's that's true of any mode of production right we have this ability to be collective um and be and humans need social interaction to survive um so i think that's one of the main things i see with the left and i mean we saw an example of that when when you were getting attacked for having uh freaking posters in your room is people just being ruthless and mean and that was the whole point of my response was like why like what are you talking like what <laughs> like why are you so mean basically um so it seems but, like a when it comes to point. people who see it as like we don't need to that's what that's my big problem with um post leftists and egoists in particular is that they see it as we will never escape capital um so i'm just gonna you know scrutinize anyone who you know oh they aestheticized something they commodified something it's like what the world we live in it's impossible not to commodify things not to aestheticize things like what do you want people to go like retreat into their own little mental world where they exist outside of capitalism because that's not possible like what's important people will be like oh we'll never escape capital so what what if we well, let's say we never escape it if you've looked at these socialist experiments that have existed in the past, it, one thing that is for certain is that they improved people's material conditions. They made their lives better. And if that's something we can do, then that's all that matters. We're just trying to build a better world for people. It doesn't need to be so deeply philosophical. It's about, it's really that simple. It's about being kind to people, connecting as communities and working towards the betterment of those communities by overthrowing oppressive, um, you know, oppressive groups and exploitative groups like the bourgeoisie. Just a, and just a connection to theory that we're, we're talking about being nice. Um, there's an article that Eleanor Marx does once, once Marx dies. And um, there's a few good ones. I, I recommend reading hers, Lafargue's, and Kovalevsky's. Um, there are notes on Marx after he dies. But um, in the one that Eleanor does, she says that, well, if you think that Marx's theories have been manipulated, right? Um, and, and if you think that his, his goals have been uh, manipulated, right? So in, in the sense of, you know, uh, communism is a big state or whatever, you know, right? Um, what has been manipulated the most is who Marx the man was. And we have this conception even among the left that Marx was like this asshole, um, this arrogant person. And the way she describes Marx is, is as one of the nicest people ever, um, as, as someone who, um, it doesn't matter how ignorant you were, if you went to go ask him a question, he would spend three hours talking to you. Um, and, and he was someone who genuinely respected people who had a great sense of humor um, and who was the embodiment of the humanist ethic that is at the core of Marxism. And we have to be able to, to, to bring that back or at least build ourselves towards that, right? Um, we'll fail right but we have to build ourselves towards that yeah and he was disgusted with the post hegelians who are kind of the example of these abstract philosophers he's like you're not doing anything to actually liberate the masses you sit in your ivory tower and write new theories but um his focus was the liberation of humanity and the betterment of like you said chandler the material conditions of humanity in any in any way you could so i think that's a great place to end it actually uh, i gotta work at 5 a.m tomorrow so i should probably go to sleep but did you have anything else you want to say chandler um no yeah that, that's about it um great conversation i'm glad y'all had me on um if y'all ever want to have me on again just hit me up i would love to talk with y'all more absolutely i think we have a lot more we can talk about and discuss and i think you really fit well we have you know with our thought and we have great conversation there so yeah yeah absolutely anything else carlos um i'm, I'm glad you weren't butt hurt about the poster things because you got some great fucking posters back there thank you <laughs> some of them that are overlapping with the ones i have in my room too so uh, <laughs> it's pretty sweet well thank you yeah no i i, I love i love having these posters on my wall because um i don't know uh this is like a big part of my life this is what i do and yeah it's it's especially when it comes to like the figures i have up on my wall i have like fanon i have 
Huey Newton, I have Ho Chi Minh, John Brown, you know, James Connolly, like these are all people that inspire me. And so, you know, having them up there serves as an inspiration. And also it's just like, this is what I love. This is what I enjoy. And I feel like it represents me pretty well. That's our, what would Jesus do bracelets? You know, what would Che do? <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. For sure. All right. Thank you so much, Chandler. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. See you, folks. For sure.